Brother Jimmy, you've had a chance. Most of you are locked in, so <laughs> I tell you from, uh, I know most of the folk here in this congregation and most of the folk here that I know, they don't get started till about now. Amen. So I'm not worried about that part of it. <clears throat> I'm praying for the Lord to have his way here tonight. I'm not interested in preaching. I told Brother Jimmy I wasn't just interested in preaching. I'm sure you're not interested in another sermon. I'm surely not interested in one. But I just want to share with you what's on my heart tonight. <clears throat> I was in uh, Waco, Texas last week, and I don't know how that it came about, but in Brother Don Smith's church, uh, Brother Ron and I were invited in a Bible conference or a pastor's conference one morning. I thought Ron set it up. He thought I set it up. And uh, I don't know exactly who set it up, but we got there. I'm glad he didn't hear the conversation I had with a couple of fellows there. One of them said, now, which one of you guys are going to out-preach the other? And I said, well, we're not in competition with each other. So many times, you know, the devil will intimidate you and make you think you're in competition. We're not uh, in collision. We're in collusion. In corporation and I told them about the two men who were hiking in the Smoky Mountains and uh, one of them looked back and he saw this grizzly bear trailing them he was just sniffing out their tracks and uh, one of them stopped immediately and took off his hiking shoes and began to put on his Nikes the other fellow turned to him and said listen Bud said, I got news for you. Won't do you one ounce of good? Put those Nikes on. You couldn't outrun that grizzly if you wanted to. And while he kept lacing them up, he looked at him and kind of smiled. He said, Bud, I don't have to outrun that grizzly. All I got to do is outrun you. <laughs> well, I, that's not the case here tonight. I'm not trying to outrun anybody at all. I want to share with you three words from the Lord's Prayer tonight, or what we call uh, Matthew, the fifth chapter, and then I want you to turn to Mark, the eleventh chapter, Matthew 5, Mark 11. Now, I want to share with you three words in this prayer that God's called to my attention and share with you a few thoughts about these three words, and I'm sure it'll be shorter than you think. I made the mistake of going golfing with a pastor friend over in Alabama one time, and I never shall forget when we got through with the golf, off the golf course and the golf game, he had this little old card. He was keeping score. It's hard to go golfing with a Baptist preacher and let him keep score. But I noticed he didn't throw the golf cart away. He put it in his pocket. And every time I went back, he'd always reminded me that he had that golf score. He always reminded me that he had it. And he could pull it out and he'd read me the scores. And he happened to beat me that time. And I wonder sometimes if this is not the case that we were guilty of holding scores and keeping scores on each other so much. I think this is what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter. Excuse me, the sixth chapter. I'm sorry. Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter. I said fifth, didn't I? Sixth chapter. Ninth verse. After this manner, Jesus said, Therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil are the evil one, for thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. For if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I'm going to ask Brother Paul if he'd lead our hearts to the throne of grace at this time. Our blessed Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the word of God that's been read. And Father, we pray that you'll rend the heavens and rend our hearts tonight. That you'll minister to Brother Sonny as you use him to minister to our hearts and our lives. That you'll open up his heart and ours as you did in the heart of the living. And we, Father, we know that he's been sick and that he's been ill of late, but Father, we pray that you'll strengthen him even physically. Blessed God, touch his mind and touch his heart. And may we see thee high and holy and lifted up. Father, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor of that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. I'm convinced that there's not but one thing keeping us from revival. I've heard it said before that we can have as much of God as we desire. But I believe with all of my heart in the past few weeks and months and years, especially the past couple of years, as I've ministered across the United States, I believe the one damning sin, I believe the one blighting sin, the one paralyzing sin that I've discovered among the saints of God is that green-eyed monster of jealousy Amen. and envy. Amen. Yes. I'm convinced with all of my heart that we, we can get to God if we want to get to God. Yes. Now, it's been the theme and the desire of this place for many, many years to see revival. I believe revival comes when we get through to God. Yes. And the Bible says in Isaiah 59, 1, the Lord said, my hand is not shortened that it cannot save. My ear is not heavy that I cannot hear. But our sins have separated us from our God. Now I'm convinced that's the only thing keeping us from revival tonight is our sins that have separated us from our God. And as we think tonight uh, on this message, I, I was thinking about a title for the message and I thought I'd title it after Ron preached on the haves who have not. Now, I'm convinced a lot of folk have who have not. Who have not what, Brother Sonny? I heard a song not long ago, what sins are you talking about? Well, I believe there are some sins that are keeping us from revival, and the one that God's talking about in the context of Matthew 6 and in Mark 11. Now, turn there, and I'll read Mark 11 with you, if you will. Mark 11, 25, listen to it. The haves who have not, who have not what, Brother Sonny? Who have not their prayers answered. Those who have, who have not their prayers answered. You may have God tonight, friend, but the Bible says if we regard iniquity in our hearts, God will not hear us. You believe it? Amen. And all the people said. Amen. And the rest of them said. Amen. Those in the back said. And don't go to sleep on us yet. It's still early. Uh, we used to have three services a night. Thank God we've cut them down to two. So we're really going to let you folk out early. This is what the Bible says here in the 25th verse of Mark 11. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father, he's speaking about a father relationship here, also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Did he say it? He did say it. Say amen. amen. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now God's saying something here, and I believe Jesus is saying in this verse of Scripture that our prayers become null and void. The haves have not their prayer answered if they forgive not those who have offended them. If they have not rid their hearts my dear friend, of offense toward those who have offended them. 
This is what he's saying, that if we harbor the slightest unforgiveness in our hearts, then we cannot expect God to answer our prayer. We cannot expect God to get through. We wonder why there's such a paralysis in the church of the living God today. I am convinced it's because we're not getting through. And I believe we're not getting through, it's because of offenses. Now Jesus said, it is impossible but that offenses should come. They're going to come. I believe this is the one thing we must guard against more than anything else in all the world is offenses. Because I would, I would adventure to say that many people or most people right here tonight on these grounds have been offended today. Now come on, folk. Let's be honest. And Jesus is saying here the Heavenly Father is going to treat us the same way that we treat others. Here's what he's saying here. Now listen to it. I believe in this matter of forgiveness and unforgiveness that God our Father in heaven is going to take his cue according to our hearts. And it's extremely important that we take serious this matter of not harboring unforgiveness in our hearts. Now friend, I find this, uh, and, and you know, I was shocked as I began to uh, research on this subject how much God has to say about how little we get our prayers through or how absolutely get no prayers through when we harbor unforgiveness in our heart. Now, friend, I believe that we could get down to business tonight if we really want to get down to business. You don't need another sermon. You don't need any more homiletics or any more humanetics, <laughs> whichever, uh, hermeneutics. You don't need either. What we need tonight is to get a hold to God. What we need tonight is what we've been praying for is to get in touch with the Heavenly Father. Now, I believe there's only one way we can get in touch with God tonight, friend. I don't care who you are in this congregation. Your prayers are null and void if there's one offense in your heart against a brother or sister. Amen. Now, God's saying it. You listen to it. You see, I, I, I've heard it said before, I believe my pastor said it, and I believe this with all of my heart. I believe that we have an invisible account book in our hearts and in our minds. And when people offend us, we pull out that little account book and we begin to mark down, well, they offended me today here. I mean, subconsciously we'll do it. If we're not careful, I know we'll start racking it up in our, in our little account book. Well, so-and-so walked down the aisle tonight and he passed me and didn't shake my hand. I'm going to put that in his account book. He owes me. And you know, what's his name? Promised me uh, uh, something and he didn't do it for me. I'm going to mark that down there. I I'm going to put that on his offense there. And did you know I told her something and she promised she wouldn't tell and she told it. I'm going to mark that down there. There's an offense there. And on and on. We could just go on and on, my friend. And that little ledger is right there. We have an account book. We keep scores on people. I believe this is why the fires of revival are thwarted in America today. I believe this is why the hand of omnipotence has been paralyzed in the church of the living God. It's because of offenses. I am convinced with all of my heart that if we, uh, even the, the clergy and the, and the leadership, uh, you know there's as much envy and hatred and malice among ministers, friend. We wonder why in the name of God, laymen can't get with God and have revival. I'll tell you, preachers need to, first of all. The first thing we need to do is rid our hearts of offenses. Take out our scorecards and let God look them over. And get them out and say, Lord, here's my account book. Uh, reveal it to me and let me make it right with you. Huh? Friend, I'm telling you something. Listen to me. I'd like to take that little account book out. Let's just look into it. And you know I can't do that, don't you? But I know someone who has an eye I can see it today. You know what God calls that an account book? Now these obvious sins, we're obvious of it. It's very obvious and other people are, uh, are aware of them. I'm convinced you can't hide what you believe about God. Amen. What you believe about God's going to come out because what you believe about God becomes obvious because if you're around a person long enough, they'll begin to reveal what's in their heart. But you know, sometimes uh, we, we, we have to be reminded. We have to be reminded uh, of this one thing, of these secret sins. God calls them secret sins in this account book. Did you ever read it in Psalms, the 90th chapter? Let, let me read it to you. Turn over there just a moment. Psalms, the 90th chapter. Turn there just a moment. I'll read it to you. Now listen to it. God's looking at the account book tonight. Psalms 90 and 8. Look at this. 
Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. Psalms 98. I'm going to give you a few moments to find it. I know you want to mark it. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. Oh, my God. Listen, friend. I've got news for you. God sees the secret sins. God understands, and, and I'm convinced with all of my heart, we cannot get to God. Our prayers are null and void. We cannot have revival. We cannot have the Spirit of God. We can't bless people with our singing and preaching. There's no anointing of God on us if we regard iniquity in our hearts. There's no anointing of God. I don't care how wonderful we may preach. I don't care what kind of theologians we are. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, there's no anointing of God on us. And the one thing that makes us different from all other sectarian groups and other groups in the world is the presence of God on us. That's the only thing that makes us different from every other organization in the world is whether or not God's here. You can talk about God. You can sing about God. But even the world knows whether or not God's on us and whether or not God's among us, friend. He's no strange God among them. Listen to me. I want you to hear something tonight because God wants to say something to us, I'm convinced. Listen, I don't have any problems. I'm talking about, first of all, I'm talking about forgiving your debtors. Those three words I want to mention, I don't think I mentioned to you in, Mark, in Matthew, uh, the sixth chapter. He mentions there uh, the, in the 12th verse, and forgive us our debts, the word debts, as we forgive our debtors, the word debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Debts, debtors, and deliverance. That's what we're talking about tonight. Our debts, our debtors, and our, and our deliverance. And let me say, first of all, before we'll ever, I believe, uh, be forgiven our debts, we've got to forgive our debtors. Amen? Amen. And some of us have to be reminded of this because we easily forget. It's not hard for me to get up in the morning and remember to put my clothes on when I get out of bed. It's not hard for me to remember to eat breakfast. It's not hard for me to remember even to read my Bible and to pray some. But let me tell you something, folk. It's very difficult sometimes. I have to be reminded by God that there's an offense in my heart or there may be an offense in your heart. And God's reminding us, listen, he said when you pray, if you don't forgive those who have offended you, my Father will not forgive you. Did he say it? We cannot get to God with offenses in our heart. This is what he's saying to us. Listen, he's saying, if you pray, forget about getting to God. If there's an offense in your heart, if there's someone even that has offended you and you haven't forgiven them. If we get to thinking about this, you'd be surprised how many of us have been offended today or this week or this past month. And it's just things we just brush back and we push back in the corners of our heart. But God said... God said that unless we forgive our debtors, we can never have our debts forgiven. Are you listening to me? Amen. And you know, it's easy for spiritual people to get offended, so to speak. I mean, I'm convinced that we convey more, as much of this as anybody. I remember that uh, last year I was in Corpus Christi, Texas, and uh, Brother Murphy was taking me to the airport. And I got to the airport, and I had 30 minutes to catch a flight. And as I was standing in line, this, uh, the, the, the uh, clerk up there was waiting on this bunch of hippies. And I was standing there, didn't have it 30 minutes, and when you've got three bags and a box to check, it takes a little time, you know. And so we were waiting, and she spent 15 minutes with this bunch of hippies up there at the desk. I was getting impatient. My, my patience was running out. And I thought, well, I'm going to miss this flight. You always think you're going to miss this flight. I guess if there's one thing that keeps me backslid <laughs> as much as anything else in the world, it's automobiles and airports. I don't know about you. I believe there's a demon on every set of driver's license, and I believe there's one standing in the door of every airport trying to block you to keep him getting on an airplane. We stood there. I had 15 minutes left. Finally, I said, you wait till I get up there. I'm going to tell this lady I want to see the manager. I mean, I was upset with that lady. I was telling a Brother Buddy what I was going to tell her, and I was going to fix her up, and I was going to tell her uh, how she was wasting my time if I missed that airplane. And finally, I got up to the desk, and when I stepped up there, she said, Oh, Brother Holland. She said, I was out the other night and heard you preach. She said, I want you to know that's one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard in my life. 
That's what you told me. I saw Brother Buddy over there. He started smiling, turning around. I said, lady, I'm sure glad you came out. We did have a good revival, didn't we? And all the time, the offense was in my... Listen to me. I'm, I'm simply saying to you, friend, listen. Uh, forgiveness is, is something we constantly have to be reminded of. And there's nothing in the world that will quench the Holy Spirit of God in our lives more than offenses. There's nothing that will stop the move of God in our churches more than offenses. There's nothing that will keep the anointing of God off of your life more than offenses. And it seems like many times that we're not even aware of the offenses. God help us. We need to realize God wants us to forgive our debtors. But you know you can never forgive your debtor unless you face your debt. Are you listening to me? I want to read you a story that God called to my attention over here in Matthew's Gospel, the 18th chapter, if you'll turn there. It's one of the most anointed stories, I believe, in the Bible to reveal to us what God's talking about in this subject in the Lord's Prayer and in Mark 11. I want you to hear it tonight. Listen to it. In Matthew's Gospel, the 18th chapter, Jesus is speaking here. <clears throat> and this, all, this, this parable comes after a question that Simon Peter asked the Lord. Listen to his words in the 21st verse. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, and I want you to hear the parable now. I say un not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore, because of re in relation to his answer, he says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But far as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, all that he had, and, pa and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord... Have patience with me, and I will pay thee. What is it? Does this sound like any of your prayers? Huh? Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and he is a compassionate God, thank God, and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest me. And this fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when this fellow servant saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise, here's the verse, listen to it. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Did you ever read that in the Bible? So, and I want you to get a picture of this. Here's a king. And this, this servant owed him 10,000 talents. You know how much that is? Huh? It's approximately, at the market value of silver today, approximately, I say, $50 million. $50 million. Could you imagine? And he, he began to beg and plead for mercy. And the Lord, the king, had compassion on him and said, Look, just forgive him everything. I'm going to wipe the debt clean. And here he goes out and finds a man who owes him. The Bible says right here, how much? How much? A hundred pence. You know how much that is? Approximately $50. Approximately. $50. $50 million compared to $50. And he takes him by the throat. He begins to demand a little measly $50 out of him. 
Now, I want you to see this in comparison to what God is saying here, you see. Jesus is teaching us something in this passage of Scripture. And the idea here is that it's not a matter of a choice, friend. God is saying to us that we're commanded to forgive our debtors. We need to understand. You say, preacher, how can I forgive them? Let me tell you something. If you ever see your debt in the light of Calvary, your debt was unpayable before Almighty God in comparison to this man. You say, but you don't know what they've done against me. What about what we did to Jesus? And Jesus gives this exaggerated parable to show us the difference in our attitude toward, other, toward others. When we harbor offenses in our hearts, friend, a $50 million debt compared to $50. And, and here we go and demand man that $50 out of a man. And Jesus is saying here, listen, thou wicked and slothful servant, the king said, oh, listen, I forgive you every bit of that debt. I had compassion on you and you won't have compassion on your brother. My friend, let me tell you something. God is saying the debt is not optional. It's not a choice. It's a command. We are commanded to forgive our brothers. Jesus is saying, that's why he said, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know why, friend, there's an appalling dilemma in our churches today, in our lives today, because we're not praying like Jesus said. We are not forgiving our offenders as God, as we want God to forgive us. Friend, you'd be surprised how many of us have kept those scorecards. How many times we jot these things down mentally in our minds. We're constantly jotting them down, constantly jotting them down. And I want to say to you, the king here, he did not say, okay, I'll give you a year to pay me. I'll give you two years to pay me. No, friend, when you came to Jesus, God didn't put any terms on it. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall become as wool. Oh, listen to me. And yet when we are offended in a $50 account, I want you to know we want immediate payment and we demand immediate payment. God said, you listen to this parable. I want you to hear it, he said. Because Peter comes up and he says, Lord, listen. So let me ask you a question. How often should I forgive my brother? <laughs> and I believe with all my heart, Peter expected to be commended of Jesus because the law demanded they forgive three times, you know. And Peter said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, I, I, I'm going to, I know this is going to sound spiritual. <laughs> Lord, listen, how often should I forgive my brother? Uh, seven times. He said, I'll just double what the law will do and I'll add one for good measure. And I know Jesus will commend that. And friend, I want you to know, he expected Jesus to applaud him. Say, well, look, Peter has joined the deeper life crowd. Peter's done got full of the Holy Ghost. He wants to forgive a brother seven times. Could you imagine? And I'm convinced if Jesus had, had said, Peter, listen, I'll let you forgive seven times. I'm convinced Peter would have counted all seven times, but that eighth time he'd have cut his ear off. I'm convinced. But what Jesus said was, no, listen, Peter, not seven times. But what did he say? Seven times 70. Until seven times. You know how many times that is? 490 times, God said. Did you know, my friend? 490 times. Now I believe that starts all over every morning. Every morning. Every morning. What's God saying? He wasn't given 490 times. He was saying however many times it takes. If you want to get to God. If you want to get your prayers answered. If you want to have God to reign in your life. However many times it takes. Then you forgive them. I'm convinced friend this is where we bog down. Because we can't find forgiveness in our hearts for our brothers and our sisters. Because we cannot find uh, in our hearts whereby we can, we can, we think that people have to, have to merit our forgiveness. We think that people, friend, have to deserve our forgiveness. When we get to looking at it on the basis that Peter talked to Jesus, I'm convinced with all of my heart uh, that this is why the church of the living God today can't have revival. is because there's so much unforgiveness in our churches. I was in Florida and a lady said to me in a meeting, I was talking to her and she said, Preacher, she said, there's a person in this city I can't stand. She came up talking to me because, in regard to the message that I preach. She said, I can't stand. She said, 
I literally despise her. I hate her. She told what integral parts of her she hated. She said, I'll never love her. You're talking about loving. If you ever know what it means to be forgiven. Friend, I'm convinced with all of my heart, if you ever know what it means to be forgiven, you can't forgive someone else. And this is what we're talking about tonight. Do you really know what it means to be forgiven? Peter's saying, oh, he thought he was going to be applauded. He thought God was going to commend him. But Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, not seven times, but seven times 70. Oh, listen. He was saying, Peter... Your forgiveness never runs out because my forgiveness never ran out. And I'm glad that Jesus said this to Peter because it reveals to us the character of Almighty God. How many people, friend, have come to you preachers and to me and say, Preacher, I just don't believe that I could get forgiveness of this sin. I've committed it so much I believe I worn out my forgiveness. No, friend, I'm convinced if God commands us to forgive 70 times 7, the Bible said, how much more doth your heavenly Father know how to avenge you of your adversary? Huh? I'm convinced that God's grace and God's mercy does not run out upon us. Oh, listen, God is saying to us, we must, we must realize that we must forgive if we ever expect God to forgive us. Do you believe that? I tell you what will happen, and I'm convinced with all of my heart this has happened to so many of us. By harboring unforgiveness in our hearts, what we've done is we put people in bondage to our lives. And there's only one way that we can free our deliverance is by freeing others. This is what Jesus has said. This is what he's saying. He said, if you forgive not those who've trespassed against thee, neither shall my heavenly Father forgive thee thy trespasses. Huh? Are you listening to me? I believe with all of my heart, if we'd get honest tonight, we could take out that little, that little invisible account book. We could find in that account book where folk have offended us. We could find in that account book where they've done us wrong, and we, we put it down there. We've kept it, in our, we've kept it in our little account book, in our invisible account book. And we wonder why God's not working in our lives. Jesus said, it is impossible but that offenses should come. Every child of God is going to face offenses. But this is the one thing that Jesus dealt with all the way through this book. Offenses, offenses. Blessed is he that is not offended in me. Offenses, offenses. And I believe this is where it is. And the only way we'll ever free our deliverance is to free those who have offended us. Are you listening to me? I wanted to share this with you since time was running close tonight. I believe that we're on the verge of revival. I don't know about these other preachers, but the last few months... I've been seeing some dews of revival. I've been seeing some mercy drops. And the very place that God has zeroed in on us is offenses. Offenses. And offenses in the church where people have built up offenses. And it's difficult, friend, to tear down those offenses. Because if, uh, you say, well, how do we know that we, we, we haven't tore them down? Because you'll always bring them up again. Just when you're offended again, you say, well, yeah, I remember when so-and-so did that to me, and I remember, and you start bringing them up again, you see. And what God is saying here is, we'll never free our deliverance. He said, deliver us from evil, the evil one. And you know, he's talking about here being turned over to the tormentors. Do you notice what he said right here in this 34th verse of this parable? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. I'm convinced there are people tormented tonight, been turned over to the tormentors because they've been held in bondage by offenses. And you look that word up, tormentors. He's put in jail. He's turned over the tormentors. And the Bible says over in Matthew, the evil one. And I believe this is an inroad of Satan to torment the saints of God because he rules in darkness, the Bible says. He can take darkness and control us. Now, I don't believe that, believe that a Christian can be demon-possessed, but I believe they can be demon-oppressed and demon-vexed and demon-tempted, excuse me, and, and, and demon-depressed. 
And I believe with all of my heart this is where the tormentors have come in on us because we, we, we have held them in bondage and except a strong man be bound, we can't rob his house. I believe he can be bound, my dear friend, by us releasing our offenders. Then we release ourselves from prison. God help us. I tell you, when I get to thinking about this, I realize how the devil has so built a strategy around the church of the living God. This is what Jesus is talking about when you pray. Listen, when you pray, Father, forgive me my debts as we forgive our debtors. You've got to realize we've got to forgive our debtors to be forgiven of our debts. This is what he's talking about here. Listen. Oh. You know what that, what that scripture literally means there in, in Matthew 5, 25? Let me read it to you. Matthew 5, 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly. Whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Listen to that. Agree with thine adversary. You know what it means? Settle the matter quickly with your offender. That's what it means. Don't put him in bondage. Settle the matter quickly with your offender, lest you be put in jail also, my friend. Listen to me. You need to realize this is where it's happened tonight, and I'm convinced with all of my heart, the reason we're not seeing the revival that we ought to see is because of offenses. Because debts that we've we put in our little secret accounts. Our little account book, we, we, we've, got our, we, we've got them marked up. And until we're willing for God to do uh, with, our, with our account book, to take that account book and, and God to take that IOU list You'd be surprised how many IOU lists we have on people today. We've charged them. But I believe it'd be wonderful after all that we've heard the last two or three days if we could just take out that little account book just in our minds tonight and let God review it with us. And let God reveal to us those that, who have offended us. Have you thought about it? Who has been an offense to you? Now, God said, listen, uh, it's not a matter of whether they're worthy of your forgiveness. It's because God commanded, because he forgave you so much, you should forgive little. It's not a matter of emotions or feeling. God didn't say if you feel like it, forgive them. He commands us to forgive them. He said if you don't forgive them, you're not going to be forgiven. This is, this is those haves who have not their prayers answered. I am convinced that we're not getting through to God because we have not forgiven those who have offended us. And until we do, we'll never be able to pray revival out, or however you want to call it. We'll not be able to see God manifest himself in the way that God wants to do. And friend, I am convinced we're on the very verge. Uh, 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 we're, on the, we're in the preparation before the presentation. I believe we're on the verge of eternity. I know we've heard this for years and years and years. I've been talking to preachers on these campgrounds today. You know, pretty soon we're going to be approaching the year 2000. I don't know how, this, how long this world's going to last, but I believe God's coming again one day. And I believe the Lord uh, would desire to take us out in revival. I'd like to go out in revival, wouldn't you? We're praying for God to send revival. I know how we can have revival. There's not, but, uh, there's no secret to revival. There's no great secret to revival. We hear about revivals breaking out. As Brother Ron said, we want to know the strategy. We want to know what program they use. There's no secret to revival. God reveals revival. <laughs> Second Chronicles 7, 13, God said, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, if I send the pestilence to devour the land, and he said, if I send all these uh, 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 noise and pestilence and things, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now, that's no secret to it. God said it. And Jesus is saying here, and I believe there's nothing that lies outside the power of prayer except that which lies outside the will of God. And I don't believe revival is outside the will of God. I believe revival is inside the will of God, inside the power of prayer. And the only reason our prayers are null and void, the only reason our prayers are hindered is because we have offenses in our hearts and in our little account books. You'd be surprised at the husbands 
and the wives who keep score cards on each other. You'd be surprised at the pastors who keep score on their church members. You'd be surprised, my dear friend, at the children who keep score on their parents. You'd be surprised at the scorecards that are hid here tonight, but open before the eyes of God if dealt with a mighty Holy Ghost revival could rush through to you personally. Because I believe you can have a personal revival if nobody else in the world has one. We may not have a collective revival here, but you can have a personal revival. You've got to have a personal revival before you can have a collective one. We could have a collective one here and you not get in on it if you didn't have a personal revival. Amen? So what's God saying? I'd like to give a little different type of invitation tonight. And I just read you these few parables because <clears throat> I knew time was short. But I want to deal with this subject. And this is the invitation. I want to give a little... I, I very rarely ever give an invitation on these conference grounds. But friend, I'd like to give an invitation tonight by us taking out our little account books. Our little IOU charts and account books and open them up before God. You see, we could start with our wife. Say, Lord, I'm going to tear up the scorecard tonight. I'm going to tear up the scoreboard and the account book. The things that I've penalized her. So many times with it. And you just keep keeping that, that score. And you say, well, well, I forgot about that. No, next time you get in a rip, it'll come up. You, ha you hadn't torn up that scorecard. You hadn't torn it up at all. You know, you could start with your husband, dear lady. You've kept a scorecard on him. You could take out that little account book and you say, Lord, I want to tear up this scorecard tonight. I don't want anything to hinder my personal relationship with thee in revival. You could start with your pastor. You could take out your scorebook that you've kept on your pastor and you could start... Saying, Lord, here it is. I want to tear up my school card. I want you to tear it apart. I'm going to tear it up in your presence tonight, God, and I want you to forgive me because I want to get my prayers through, and I want you to forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. You can forget about praying, folk, if you're not willing to pray that prayer. You can forget. Uh, listen, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. Listen, David prayed, Oh, Lord, search me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Would you be willing to pray that prayer tonight? and lead me to thy path everlasting. I want you to know you can have a revival here tonight if you want one. You could take that same thing and you, you, could, you could open that scorecard with your brother or your sister, your mom. You've kept score on her all these years, that faithful old mother or that dad. You, you've kept score on her. You say, yeah, uh, right here. That person hurt me. They lied about me. They wronged me. They gossiped. They undermined me. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. If you'd write down all those offenses you've got right there in your mind mentally and all the people you have them against, if you'd be willing to bring that scoreboard and just tear it up before God and lay it at the altar, I promise you, revival will roll in this place, in your heart, if you'd be willing to tear it up, if you'd be willing to destroy it tonight. Because Jesus said, and I believe what he said here, he said, listen, so likewise, the secret to this whole parable is the 35th verse. So likewise, this is Matthew 18. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts. See, you don't have to have an emotion, uh, um, an emotion over it. And friend, you don't have to feel like they're worthy of you tearing up that scorecard. If you from your heart forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Did he say it? He did say it. He did say it. There's one verse of Scripture that leads us into this victory. Listen to it, Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Would you be willing to take that IOU scorecard tonight, that little invisible account book, and lay it before God, have him tear it up, huh? That secret sin... I was in North Carolina in a meeting and, and I was sharing on secret sins and a lady got up. She came to the altar and she began to weep and pray and ask God to forgive her for holding an offense against her sister. For two years she had not spoken to her. She lived down in Florida and for two long years she had not said a word to her. They wouldn't even communicate they were, they were blood sisters. And she was just weeping and asking God to forgive her because she held an offense in her heart. She said, Preacher, I've got to go home and call my sister and tell her I'm sorry. The next night she came back to the service. 
she got up before the church and she said, Folk, Brother Fred Gilbert was with me there. He heard the testimony. She said, Folk, she said, last night God convicted my heart of the offenses that I've held against my own family. I've kept score on them. I've kept an account book on them. I would not erase it. And all the time I was teaching Sunday school, coming to the house of God, praying to God, my prayers were not getting through because God said that my heavenly Father wouldn't hear me if I wouldn't forgive my trespasses, those who trespassed against me. He said, I forgave her last night. I went home and I called her on the telephone. And when I got on the line, said, I called her by name and she said, is that you, honey? And she broke down weeping. She said, oh, thank God you called. Friend, this isn't a fairy tale. It was told just last year in Greensboro, North Carolina. She said, darling, I'm so glad you called. I was just fixing to go to the bathroom. I had everything prepared. I was going to take my life. I didn't think anybody in this world cared. I was going to end it all tonight. I'm so glad you called. And she broke down in uncontrollable weepings. My friend, she not only let her sister out of prison, but she got out of prison herself. And I want you to know we will never free our deliverances until we are willing to forgive those who have offended us. And friend, we can go on and keep on preaching. And we can keep on talking about revival. But we'll never see God move in our lives until we're willing to tear up our scorecards against each other. May we pray.